welcome everyone to our Sunday afternoon service. Uh, it's good to see you guys today, and thank you for joining us today uh, in this time of worship together. And uh, I know right now is a busy time for all of you college students. You guys have finals coming up, and you guys must be stressed. But uh, yeah, just thank you for making it a priority to come and, and worship and uh, to hear God's word together today. Well, um, my name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Family Chapel, and it's my privilege to share with you God's word for today. And so, uh, yeah, we're going to get right into it. Um, you see, there is a powerful force in uh, each and every one of our hearts. There's a powerful force. There, every single one of us is motivated by and has a longing for this one thing, every single one of us. And that is to be accepted. To be accepted. To have a sense of belonging. To know that there is something, a place, a person that fully welcomes us in. We all long for acceptance, to be accepted. You see, this is the reason why for so many of us, right, friends and community is of such great importance, right? We want to find that group, that place where we feel accepted. This longing for acceptance is why so many people are, are desperately chasing after that romantic relationship, a, a relationship where you are accepted and loved there, right? And this is why cat ladies become cat ladies, because with cats, they are always accepted and always loved, right? Right? Whether it's a group of friends a romantic partner, or a bunch of cats, right? We are all looking for that place of acceptance, a place where we know that we are fully loved, uh, fully known, and fully loved, right? Now, as we kind of reflect upon this, it brings us to a deeper question, a, a much weightier question, right? A question that we have all asked before, or maybe some of us are too afraid to ask. And the question is this, am I accepted by God? Am I accepted by God? Yes, you know, am I accepted by friends or whatever, you know, these things we look for, yes. But am I accepted by God? Do I have a place of belonging with God? Does God fully welcome me in? You see, the people in our passage today, they're asking a, a very similar question. Right? We're, we're continuing the book of Philippians, and, and, and as we have previously heard, the Philippian church is in a time of much persecution. It's a hard time to be a Christian in these days. And it's always in the times of immense suffering, right, is it not, that, that we ask these questions the most. Right? When, we're, when we're suffering, when things are hard, we ask the questions, where are you, God? Are you for me? Are you with me? Have you accepted me? Am I one of your people? Well, while they were asking this question, right, while the Philippian church were, was asking this question, a certain group of religious leaders, uh, religious teachers came along claiming to have the answer, right? These group of teachers who we know of as Judaizers, they came in and they began teaching the people in the church that acceptance by God is possible. That yes, it is possible to be accepted by God, but they said this, that it's only possible as long as you are marked by the sign called circumcision. Circumcision. Now, for those of you who don't know what circumcision is, just a you know, quick recap. When, when baby boys are born, right, they are normally born with a piece of skin that extends you know, past the head of the male you know, thing, right? And, and circumcision is cutting that off, right? Oh, it's painful, but, but it's, it's cutting that off, right? Well, well circumcision, right? right? Right now for us today, it might not be that amazing of a thing because usually everyone does it right it's, it happens you know usually when people are when babies are born but circumcision was not a common thing back then as it is now but it was something that the jewish people actually had been doing for thousands of years right jewish people actually they started circumcision and it happened it started since the time of abraham right back in genesis what we see is when god makes his covenant his promise with abraham god gives abraham the command to circumcise himself and his entire family as a sign that they are god's covenant people, right? They're God's people, right? He says, because I have accepted you, because I have chosen you, because now you are my people, do this circumcision as a sign of remembrance and a sign of remembrance of the covenant. So ever since then, right, ever since God gave that to Abraham, the Jewish people have continued to circumcise their children in order to remember the grace of God and to stay faithful to the relationship that God has made with them. You see, circumcision, even from the beginning, it was never about just the act, the mere act of cutting off the skin, but it was a sign of a deeper spiritual reality, that their hearts were circumcised, and they were now devoted and set apart to God. 
But over time, right, we see in the Jewish, in somewhere in Jewish history, we see a shift began to happen, right? At, at one point, uh, people began to look at obedience to the law, right, which includes circumcision. They saw that as a religious act that could prove that they are accepted by God, right? Rather than looking first to God, rather than looking first to his grace and to the fact that he has accepted them and then walking in obedience in response, they first looked to their obedience first as their access to God. They flipped it upside down. So now flash forward to the time of Philippians, right? Flash forward. And, and these Judaizers, these Jewish Christian teachers were teaching this to the church, right? That they were saying, non-Jewish Gentiles, you can be confident that you are accepted by God if you get circumcised. Now, you might be wondering, right, what's the big deal, right? What's, you know, why, you know, this doesn't really make much sense to me. It doesn't really uh, matter to me now. But this was actually very appealing to the Christians at the time. You see, you see, in this immense time of suffering, in this time when they were unsure of God's acceptance, to hear that there was a way to be fully confident in this truth that God has accepted them was a very appealing thought. And they're probably thinking at this time, you're telling me that I can point to this thing, this action of circumcision, I can point to this, I can do this, and I can be confident that God has accepted me as one of his people, that I am his, that he is with me. It was a very appealing thing for these Christians to hear this, and, and they, were, they were swayed by this. And, while, and just as this was an appealing thing to the Christians at this time, it might not be circumcision, but a similar thing is appealing for Christians today as well. You see, for all of us, we also ask this deep, this kind of scary question as well, right? We also ask, does God accept me? Is God with me? And this question, the answer to this, it's, it's a very easy thing to doubt. Right? We've mo most of us, have, yes, we've heard the Sunday school answers. Most of us, we have this conceptual understanding in our heads that we are accepted. But are we confident in our hearts that this is true? That we have a place of belonging with God? And I think for all of us, if we're being honest with ourselves, we have moments when we doubt this. Right? I'm, I have moments when I doubt this. You see, for us, whenever we sin, whenever we fall short, whenever, we, we, whenever it seems that God is not present with, present with us, in these moments, isn't it so easy for us to doubt whether or not God is on our side? You see, and in these moments when we start doubting this, when we start doubting that if we are accepted by God, it is in these times that we desperately try to cling on to something, anything that will give us the confidence to say, of course God has accepted me. Of course God accepts me, right? And so we say things like, well, I've been going to church my whole life. Of course God accepts me. Or we say things like, I've been serving on the praise team since I was 12. Of course God accepts me. I went on mission trips. I joined a student campus ministry. I was in a small group. Of course God accepts me, right? We say things like, I tithe a lot of money. I read the Bible. I'm a leader in the church. I do so many good things for people. I am a good person. Of course God accepts me. And we cling on to these things because we, we, we desperately try to cling on to something. But on the flip side, there are those of us today that are the opposite, right? There's those of us today that haven't done any of these things, right? I haven't gone to church my whole life. I've been inconsistent. I don't serve as much as I should. I don't tithe as much as I should. I don't read the Bible. I'm not a good person. And some of us may be tempted to think, of course God doesn't accept me because of this. Whoever you are, whichever side you find yourself on, we all find ourselves in a similar situation as the Philippians. Just like with circumcision, we are all tempted to center our acceptance by God around the things that we do. Right? We all say to ourselves, I can be confident because, because of the things I have done, or I can't be confident because of the things that I haven't done. And you see, it's in the midst of this situation that Paul writes these words to the Philippian church. Right, hearing the message that the Judaizers are preaching about circumcision, Paul writes not only to condemn their teaching, but also to encourage the church that full acceptance by God is possible. And it is not by the works of the flesh. It is not by circumcision. No, Paul shows the church and us today that we can be fully confident of this because not of the things we do or do not do, but by the correct confidence, by the right confidence, by our true confidence, which is in the work and person of Christ Jesus alone. So that being said, look to, let's look together at Philippians chapter 3. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. You can uh, follow along on the, on, the, uh, on the big screen, or you can follow along in your bulletins, or, or turn there with me together. But we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3.
Philippians chapter 3, we're going to start with verses 1 to 3 at this time. So there, this is the reading of God's word. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Let's pause there. You see, Paul begins the section by addressing first the Judaizers. And in, in just, you know, in, in a great, in just like brilliant language, Paul, he, he completely flips their message upside down, right? He begins by saying this, right? Beware of the dogs, the evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh. And while this may not be seem uh, like much to us, this is actually a huge insult towards those Jewish teachers. You see, at the time, Jewish people, uh, they were not fond of Gentiles, right? They were not fond of anyone who was not Jewish. And so when they spoke of Gentiles, they would use very insulting, demeaning words such as these, right? And they would refer to Gentiles as dogs, right? They would refer to them as evildoers. They would refer to them as mutilators of the flesh, right? These people who, in their mind, were not accepted by God, they would call these Gentiles these things. And Paul now, right? Hearing all this, knowing that this is how they refer to the Gentiles, he flips this around, and rather than saying that the Gentiles are the dogs, the, the, the evildoers and mutilators, he calls the Jewish teachers these things. He says to you, them, you guys are the real Gentiles in your eyes. You who teach these messages as, you, as if you are accepted by God, you are not God's people. And Paul follows this up with an emphatic statement. And he says, you are not God's people. No. We are the circumcision. He says, we are the circumcision. In the start of verse 3. You see, Paul says, right? He says, it is not you who push for action. It is not for you who push for the action of cutting off skin that are, are, that are those who are God's people. No, we are the circumcision, right? Again, remember, circumcision was a sign given to show that they are God's people. And so Paul is saying that we are God's people, we are the circumcision. We, the church, circumcised or not, we are God's people. We are the ones who are accepted by God. We are the ones who have a place of belonging with God. We are the ones who are welcomed in by God. We don't need the ritual of circumcision any longer because we are the circumcision. See, Paul, he, he, he very clearly draws a line and says, no, it is, not, it is not circumcision that you need. No, it is we are already the circumcision. And so Paul continues on after this, right, describing who the people are. And he says in verse 3, he continues on, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So who are the people of God? Who are the ones who are accepted? Who are the ones who, are, who, are, who have been brought in? It is the people who, one, worship by the Spirit of God, and two, Glory in Christ Jesus it is the people who worship God as Savior and who, who give him glory as being Christ, as king. You see what Paul doesn't mention here? He doesn't mention anything about circumcision. He has no mention of any ritual or ceremony that we must do. No mention of having to earn it ourselves. Simply, what Paul says is worship and glory in Christ. And this is how we, be, we are brought in as people of God. Paul is saying, this is our true confidence. This is our true confidence. Our true confidence is Christ alone. Right? The people of God are those who place their confidence in the work of Christ alone and put no confidence in the flesh. What Paul is doing here is he's pitting these two things to, against each other. Right? These two ways of life he's pitting against each other. Confidence in the flesh versus confidence in Christ. Right? These two things are incompatible. Right? Either we'll see our acceptance as people of God as something that we generate or something that is given by Christ alone. Right? There is no in-between. There is no God plus man. There is no Jesus plus me. Right? It is either all me or all Jesus. You see, for us today, as we stand here, as we sit here, as we hear God's word, right? I know this is not a new message for us. This is a gospel message. But you can be confident today that you are accepted by God, not because of the work that you have done, but because of Christ's work alone. Christ's work has made you righteous, right? When you cling on to him, when you place your faith in him, you are fully accepted. You are fully loved. You are fully known. You are fully brought in. And you have a place of belonging now next to God. 
in God's presence because and only because of the work of Christ. You see, I know for many of us, we, we know this. Many of us, we've heard this message before, and it's easy for us to know this in our heads, but it's another thing for us to believe this. There is cognitive dissonance for many of us, right? Because although we know this in our heads, it is hard for us to believe because this is actually not how the world works. It's not how the world works, right? Right? The world, in the world, what the world always says is we have to earn it, that we have to earn what we receive, right? If we want to be accepted, we have to earn it, right? If you want to be accepted by friends, you have to earn it by being the coolest version of yourself. You have to earn it by being the funniest version of yourself. You have to earn it by, by doing all these things and showing that you are a good friend. And then and only then will you be accepted as a good friend, right? You have to earn good relationships. You have to earn, uh, you have to earn what you get at work, right? If you, want to get, if you want to get a promotion, if you want to get more money, you have to earn that, right? You have to work for that. You have to work for the accolades, right? Everything in this life, everything that is in the world, it operates in this way. We have to earn what we get. We have to earn acceptance from the world. But this is not so with Christ. This is not so with Christ. And Paul, he goes on to explain how this is the case by sharing his example, right? Because we see in Paul someone who has accomplished a lot. And yet Paul, right, looks at all that and he shows a very countercultural understanding of his life. Look with me at verses 4 through, uh, four through, seven, four through 6 at this time. In verse 4, Paul continues on saying, Though I myself have reasons for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. See, Paul, what he says is, look at, he, he prints a picture of himself and shows how he has met every human requirement, right? All the requirements of the flesh, Paul has met each and every one of these things. You see, Paul, in this day and age, in this religious uh, Judeo-Christian society, right? Paul is, he's like the top, he's the cream of the crop. He's got it all, right? He's the, per he's the first person when it comes to your mind when you think of someone who is a shoe in for heaven, right? He's the first person you think of when, you'd be, when you think about people who'd be accepted by God. Paul is a shoe in because he has the pedigree. He has, it, he has it all. He has, he has, the, he has the, the name. He has, the, he has the, the works. He has everything. And yet, right, yet even still, even when Paul has everything, right, even when he's at the pinnacle, Paul says all of this is useless. He continues on in verse 7 and says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul, he looks at all these things. He looks at the, he looks at the accolades. He looks at his pedigree. He looks at all the things that he has accomplished. All the things that the rest of the world would say, man, Paul, you, you earned it. Paul, you've, you, you've earned your acceptance, right? All these things that, that most people will look at and say that, Paul turns it around and looks at that and says, that is all rubbish, refuse, poop. It's useless. It's, 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 it's trash. It's, it's a pile of garbage, right? There, there is not, none of these things are sufficient to, to, to gain acceptance into God's presence, right? All of these things, right, even if Paul has hit the, the pinnacle, even this, he cannot reach the bar that is set by God. It cannot work. None of these things are sufficient, right? If we go about our, the rest of our lives trying to attain a certain level, what Paul is saying is it's, it's wasted, right? You can, get to, you can climb up the, the, the ladder as high as you want, but even at the top of the ladder, you're still miles off. You see, confidence in the flesh, right? Paul, what Paul is saying is this. If you place your confidence in the flesh, if you place your confidence in pedigree, if you place your confidence in the things that you do, there is no acceptance, right? It's meaningless. It's useless. Work as hard as you can, right? Try to achieve as much as you can, and there will still be no progress. You will still not receive and attain the acceptance from God that you desire in your heart. But you place your confidence in Christ. Place your confidence in him and in his work. Place your confidence in his, in his name and in, in the finished work of the cross. And you get full acceptance. 
you are fully accepted. God is with you now and forever, right? He, he looks at you, and, he are, and, and you are now his. He is with you. You see, when we place our confidence in Christ alone, we gain the full acceptance that our hearts desire. Friends, would you place your confidence in Christ? Place your confidence in him alone. I know for many of us, right, we, we, look, at, we look at our lives and, and we think, man, if only I could achieve that, that next thing. Right? If only I could work a little bit harder. If only I could be a little bit smarter. If only I could, I, could, I could serve God a little bit harder. Maybe then, and maybe then, God will accept me more. Maybe then I might earn my way into, into God's presence. But no, remember this. It is confidence not in ourselves, not in the flesh, not in any of the works of the flesh that can do that. But it is confidence in Christ alone that will grant you the full acceptance that you need and you desire in your heart. Place your confidence in him, and he will make you righteous. It says in verse 9, right? And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Do you want to be made righteous before God? Do you want to be accepted by God? I know we all do. In our hearts, every single one of us longs for this, to be accepted by him. That righteousness comes from faith alone. Place your faith in him. Place your confidence in him. Boast in Christ alone and not in the flesh, and you will receive this. You will be accepted. So with that being said, what does it look like now, right? What does it look like now for us to, to live in this way? What does it look like us to live in a way that is confident in Christ? Well, one, again, it's to stop trying to find worth in our works, right? For us, I know for every, every single one of us, there is something that we look at, something that we, that we think, if I just do a little bit more of this, then I can gain acceptance, right? Stop trying to find your worth in your works. Be willing to lose it all, right? Be willing to lose all you feel tempted to gain acceptance, right? The abilities, the pedigree, whatever you're pursuing after. Right? Stop trying to find your worth in these things because they will not satisfy and they will not give you the acceptance that you need. And with that, once you put those aside, would you seek simply to know Christ, to know him, to know his grace, to know his gospel, to know his love. Right? Paul, again, he says, right, he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Knowing Christ is the greatest thing that we can do. Knowing Christ more is, 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 is the greatest thing that we can devote and, and commit our lives to now. And you see, now that we have been accepted, when we place our confidence in Christ, and we have been accepted by God, we now have fellowship with him. And you now have access to the Father, and you can now draw near to God. And as James says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Seek to know God. Spend time with him. Draw near to him. Right? Spend time in his word. Pray to him. Because in all these things, God allows us to know him more. God reveals himself to us more and more through these means of grace. Would you seek to know Christ? I know for many of us, you might be thinking, right, like, that's it, right? That's, that's all we have to do, right? That's, you know, like, you know, tell us to, like, do something, right? But you see, the thing is this. If we don't get this right, if we don't understand the gospel first, that, that it's not anything that we do that, that earns our acceptance, then we're never going to get the rest of the Christian life. You see, next week, what we're going to see in the book of Philippians is we're going to see, yes, that Paul continues on this argument and says, right, not that I've already attained this goal or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. But first, it all, is, it all rests upon the gospel message first. That it's not about what we do or the, the amount that we press on that earns our acceptance. But no, it is Christ's righteousness alone. It is Christ's work alone that makes you righteous before him. So would you know this? Spend time to know this. Spend time to, to, to really know and to really embrace the gospel message. With that being said, I want to lead us in one application. Just give us one quick application. And it's this. Uh, would you reflect on this message each day? 
You see, I know for us, right, again, this is not the first time we've heard this. This is, you know, we maybe have heard this before in Sunday school. We've heard this at church. But I think for some of us, we hear this message again, and we might think, man, you know, let's move on, right? What's the point of, why do we keep talking about this gospel thing? Right? Why, let's move on to, to what we, we need to do together, right? Let's move on to, to bigger things, to more important things, right? We, 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 we get hung up on this. But, but you see, the thing is this. Paul acknowledges something here, right? In the, in the first two verses, we see Paul that he acknowledges something very profound about humans in general, right? In verses 1 and 2, again, going back to the beginning, it says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. You see, this is not the first time that Paul has spoken these words, right? Paul has spent a lot of time with the Philippians, teaching them the gospel, showing them that it is not by works of the, works of the flesh that we receive righteousness, but showing them it is only confidence in Christ alone that does so. And yet, Paul continues to write the same things to them, right? And now Paul, he has every right, right? And as he's in prison and he's hearing about the Philippian church kind of falling to these same temptations, right? Paul has every right to look at them and be like, again, what's wrong with you guys, right? I taught you this before. Why do you, why do you keep messing up, right? Remember these things, right? Paul has every right to be upset at the Philippians. And yet, Paul responds with so much grace. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me. Paul does this over and over again because he acknowledges this, that we as people... We are forgetful people. We as a people, we're, we're, we're so easy to go back to the patterns of our flesh, so easy to try to, to, try to gain our acceptance through our flesh. We're so, we're so quick to, to go back to our old patterns of life. And for us, we need to be reminded of this continually, right? It's not, I should know this by now, or it's not, I know, let's move on, right? It's no, it's something that we need to hear over and over and over again. So would you reflect on this message daily? Would you reflect on this message yourselves, but also would you communicate this to your brothers and sisters, to those around you? Remind them of the gospel truth. Remind them that it is confidence in Christ alone that brings full acceptance by God. And the best way that we can reflect on this is by rejoicing, rejoicing in him. That's why he starts off, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. When we rejoice in him, we remember his goodness. We remember the work that he has done. So let's reflect and rejoice. And let's place our full confidence in Christ alone from here on out. At this time, let me, let's enter into a time of prayer as we, uh, yeah, as we just reflect upon the word that God has given to us. For all of us, we all desire this acceptance from God, but Every single one of us has been trying to find it in different things. At this time, would you really reflect on, on just the ways in which you have been doing so? And as you, as you think about these things, as you think about the ways that you have been trying to gain God's acceptance out of your flesh, would you lay these things aside? Would you pray now? Lord, it's not in these things that I do. It's not in my abilities or in my talents or in the things that I'm accomplishing that I receive, I receive acceptance. But no, it is God, Christ alone. Would you pray this in your heart? Would you pray that God would make this truth a deeper reality in your heart today? And would you pray that God would give in your heart a deep confidence in the work of Christ? And that now laying off the things of the flesh, that we would now seek to know Christ, that we now seek to honor Christ, that we now seek to follow Christ. Would you pray for this? And would you also pray a prayer of thanks that God would do this work for us, that God would accept us, a wretched people, in this way? Let's take this time to pray and reflect on the message.